Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. If you're an all-electric system and you're dependent on electricity, it's about a million dollars a mile to move electricity. And if you're looking at having a large vertiport, you're probably going to have to have your own substation. Well, if there's one thing people hate more than heliports, it's substations. Yeah, I want electricity, but don't build that here. So if I have to put in a substation to support this, well, it may only take me six months to do the FAA paperwork. It takes two years to permit a substation. It takes two years to build one. And all the components are on back order 18 to 24 months. Thank you for joining us for another episode of The Vertical Space. What follows is a conversation with Rex Alexander, one of the preeminent global leaders on the topic of vertical flight infrastructure, from drone ports to vertiports to heliports. Rex has over four decades of military, general, and commercial aviation experience. He's the founder and president of Five Alpha, an aeronautical consulting firm, and has served as infrastructure advisor to the Vertical Flight Society for over three years. Rex is heavily involved in shaping the infrastructure regulatory landscape across a number of groups. The U.S. Helicopter Safety Team Infrastructure Working Group, where he's a co-chair, the National Fire Protection Association 418 Standard for Helicopters, which he chairs, ASTM International F-38 WK-59317 New Specification for Vertiport Design, and several others. Rex is a former U.S. Army warrant officer and Aero Scout helicopter pilot, instructor pilot, and standardization instructor. He served both on active duty and in the Indiana Army National Guard. We sat down with Rex and uncovered an entire Pandora's box of important infrastructure issues, including the Catch-22 involving EV toll performance, passenger tolerance for ride quality, and business models. Rex takes the time to explain in painful detail all the different regulatory layers that impact heliports and vertiports, from federal down to local, and how they influence timelines and locations where vertiports are most likely to show up. And in the process, we also highlight gaps in existing regulations. We touched on so many other thought-provoking topics, vertiport ownership models, how operator business models impact vertiports, or the other way around, who stands to make the most money on infrastructure, opportunities for entrepreneurs, and the number of cottage industries that will emerge on the back of vertiports, factors impacting public acceptance, the wild west of drone ports, advice to entrepreneurs, and what vertiport designers can learn from the elevator industry. Of course, there's more, and we'll be sure to invite Rex for another episode because we've just started to scratch the surface on this important topic. Enjoy the conversation with Rex. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let UAvionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access or beyond visual line of sight operations. UAvionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace. Rex, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast today. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Looking forward to the discussion. Perfect. So we will talk about vertiports, drone ports, broadly the ground infrastructure to support advanced air mobility. And on that topic, first thing we ask, is there anything that very few in the industry agree with you on? Uh, Good question. Um, I would say the one topic I probably get the most pushback on in this space is uh, probably on aircraft performance capabilities when we start talking about EV tall aircraft. So we deal with performance as building the case for the infrastructure for helicopters and heliports. I'm pretty much a show me and prove to me that you can do it kind of person. So I haven't seen an EV tall land in an urban environment with a 15 knot crosswind yet. Once they do, I'll consider buying stock. But uh, there's a lot of hypothetical assumptions on EV tall performance characteristics when it comes to real world applications. 
in urban environments when we have to considerations for turbulence, crosswinds, updrafts, downdrafts. And I haven't seen anybody take that into consideration yet. Um, the other part of the equation that I think that I probably push hard on is passenger ride quality. I see a lot of trajectories that EV tall aircraft are capable of, but uh, just because your aircraft can do something doesn't mean the people in the back are going to pay for that. It's um, it's where we get into that. If you're expecting a limo ride and you pay for a limo ride, you're not going to put up with a carnival ride. So will they come back? And I think that's one of the things when we look at infrastructure design has a significant role to play in passenger comfort and vice versa. The EV tall aircraft performance characteristics play a huge role in how we design the infrastructure for that same comfort level. I, I would say that's probably the one area that I get a little bit of heartburn from people with. Let's certainly unpack this in the discussion to follow to see exactly how performance and ride quality impact considerations on vertiports. And let's not only limit the conversation to vertiports for EV tolls, but, but also consider drone ports, the ground infrastructure required for things like drone deliveries or drone operations at scale. Sure. That's one of the issues we're seeing in the federal government right now. When we talk about um, heliports, we have a definition. Vertiports, we're working on a definition. No one has come up with or is working on what is a drone port and how do we account for drone ports? Where are they being shown in the system from a data capture and are they being you know, transparent to the other players in the aviation industry? I think that's an area that we need to see a huge improvement from our friends in the federal government. So let's start with the basics then. Can you explain to us the differences between a verdict port, heliport, and let's throw in a drone port in as well? <laughs> um, in the general aspects, there's not a huge difference in how it's designed. So the design of a vertiport, an airport, or a heliport, or even a drone port is based on the equipment that's going to go there. And we look at what that equipment size and weight is. That's going to drive your geometry of the footprint. So when you look at a heliport and a drone port or a heliport and a vertiport specifically, you have three pieces of the landing area that we primarily pay attention to. The touchdown liftoff area, the TLOF, the FADO, the final approach and takeoff area, and then the safety area. So each one of those is dictated by the design aircraft. The bigger the aircraft, the bigger each one of those then becomes. I don't see a huge difference uh, between those at a heliport and a vertiport or even a drone port because they're driven by size. Now, the airspace that attaches to it is based on performance criteria. We have performance information, empirical data that we point to for helicopters. Now, the caveat to that is the heliport design advisory circular that the FAA publishes, uh, AC1505390. Dash two Charlie, which is the one that's currently in print, uh, doesn't really get into the performance criteria. It's a very prescriptive document. The FAA is moving towards an ICAO theory of performance-based infrastructure. It's taking a while. Vertiports in the engineering brief that the FAA published is basing the concept of the vertiport on a specific aircraft design. So it's, it's a surrogate aircraft, if you will, based on all the different EV tall aircrafts. But performance plays a role in part of that. Now, the problem we're at right now from a performance standpoint for vertiports and EV tall is we don't have any good empirical data to lean on that speaks to what an aircraft can and can't do. There's a lot in print and online that says EV tall aircraft will be superior to helicopters. But to date, there's no published data that I can lean on and point to and say, yes, they've proven that. Until that happens, I think, and the FAA has done this, and we can see it in their engineering brief, they're conservative. So they're being more prescriptive than I think a lot of the OEMs probably would like. So the performance characteristics of these vehicles is a necessary input to then designing the airspace around the vertiports and, and the drone ports. Very much so. I mean, when you look at what an aircraft can and can't do, you have to then take that into account when you design the infrastructure. So it is supportive. It's as low risk and safe as you can possibly make it. And to the degree you can do it, it's forgiving. You, you don't want infrastructure designed to the optimum of everything 100% of the time. You're, you're never going to have optimum weather, never going to have optimum pilot performance. You're never going to have optimum 
aircraft performance 100% of the time. So you have to build in that forgiveness. When we look at passenger comfort, one of the things that we're paying a close attention to uh, some of the NASA work is G-forces. So when you're approaching or departing, you're either accelerating or decelerating, and there's a G-loading that the passengers are being uh, held to. And it's it's how much is comfortable. So when we look at what uh, what the average person is willing to put up with, it's not a lot. Uh, they did a lot of testing back in the 70s on passenger comfort and G-loading, and um, I think 0 0.08 is G's is the load factor for deceleration. And um, I want to say it's uh, 0.15 for acceleration. So it's not a significant factor that we're looking at. So when you're shooting your approach, at what point do you hit your final approach fix? At what point do you start your deceleration? At mm -hmm. what point is your entry airspeed? How long of a distance do I need to account for, for that deceleration? And what's that look like at the bottom? In the EV tall community has been very keen on talking about vertical operations. We don't have a lot of good data in aviation, at least, that talks to what is the tolerance levels of G loading for passengers in the vertical. The one organization or the one industry that does is the elevator industry. They, they've done 100 plus years of research on what the individual tolerance levels are for G loading, and it's, it's not significant. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to be a limiting factor to what aircraft are called upon to do. That then is going to impact what we design as designers for airspace. So if we consider passenger comfort and aircraft performance, and we account for all of the real world impacts, given what you know today, what does that mean to the density of these verdict ports in an urban environment? And consequently, what is the impact on scalability and, and the business viability? I think the question you have to first then address is how big of a vertiport is it you're looking to achieve? And what's the throughput of that vertiport? Uh, when we look at existing infrastructure like heliports today that we may point to and say, hey, we want to convert that to a vertiport, the first question I always tell people in this space, is it really a heliport? And if it is really a heliport, is it a good heliport? Most heliport business cases are not designed for high throughput. They're designed around a single aircraft, land, shut down, stay. Uh, we're looking for something that has throughput. And throughput then dictates having a footprint that allows for parking. And most heliports are not designed to expand. They're cramped already for just the landing area. So in looking at what we're trying to do here, if you're trying to retrofit, you need to make sure that you have the land use available for the expansion to allow for the throughput you're trying to achieve. That may be one landing area, that may be two, three, or four, and that may be anywhere from three, five, all the way up to 15 parking spaces. That becomes a fun challenge in urban environments. We see a lot of the OEMs gravitating over the past year towards um, airports because there's a lot of cities that have small underutilized airports that are a good starting point. As far as densely urban populated areas, we'll see um, people gravitating towards parking garages. May work. Uh, there's some caveats we can discuss a little bit. On the, on the offset, though, Greenfield may be the way to go down in the long term just to get that high volume throughput if that's what you're looking for in the business case. And so do you think that the that industry will gravitate towards a smaller number of larger vertiports versus a distribution of smaller vertiports within an urban environment, which really is ultimately where a lot of the UAM companies want to be, right? They want to be closed and offer flexibility to their customers from an end-to-end, point-to-point kind of uh, perspective. I think it'll be... It'll be different in different uh, regions of the country. Demographics, uh, business models, and demand will drive that. Uh, so there will be certain areas where we probably will see larger vertiports, but fewer of them. And there's other areas that we'll probably see more, but smaller. And that, that's something that I know that will probably shake out over about the next 10 years. When you, when you look at putting a large vertiport in with a high volume, that's not something you can do just everywhere. And volume of traffic is interesting because we don't have any heliports out there today that really have the volume that we're talking about for vertiports. Even some of the regional airlines, it's smaller airports, 
don't have this type of volume. How will the surrounding public and environment absorb that? Will they absorb that? So we may actually see smaller ones being more appealing to the average public. Rex, what's kind of, give the listener kind of a state of the vertebrate industry today. Where are they? How are they being built? Who are they being built by? And how do you see it play out in the next couple of years? Excellent question. The state of the vertebrate industry is in its infancy. I've seen a lot of different organizations show up on my radar that I honestly have never heard of. There are some that I know that I've worked with in the heliport world for years who are migrating into the vertiport industry. As far as something that's built today, there really isn't anything in the United States, at least, that I can point to and say, hey, that's a vertiport. A lot of people say, well, you, Chicago's has a vertiport. Dallas has a vertiport. In name only, because when you look at the regulation, when you look at the standard and what documents are filed, every one of those say the word heliport. You can call it a vertiport if you want but it met the standard for a heliport. It was designed as a heliport and it was put into the system as a heliport. Going forward, we need a standard for vertiports to actually build one in the United States. That's the Federal Aviation Administration, but it's also fire code and building code, land use, municipality, permitting, ordinances, all those things have to be in place to actually build something that we then call a vertiport. There are a lot of people out there in this market that are popping up and saying, hey, we're going to build a vertiport. And I I advise investors and I advise uh, individuals that are landowners to be very, very careful of who they partner with. Make sure they have some experience in vertical lift because airports and vertiports, airports and heliports are different. Business cases are different. Operations are different. And I've seen airports who have tried to run heliports and have run them into the ground. So in that urban environment, yet to be seen what that answer looks like. I'm, I'm, I'm saying you're going to see vertiports that in the initial phase within the next five years are basically retrofitted airports. That's the easiest path forward, less expensive path forward, probably the safest path forward. As we move into the next five to 10 you're going to see greenfield of uh, vertiports. Converting a, hel- a true heliport into a vertiport, probably not going to see that much unless you want just a single landing area because it, the average heliport doesn't have the space. Rex, one thing you've said that's really interesting is that the it's, it's a little bit of the tail wagging the dog in a sense. Is the vertiport going to be built based on the capabilities of the aircraft or will the aircraft be built based on the capabilities of the vertiports? If you're saying that over the next several years, they're essentially going to be, let's say, the smaller 5,000 airports, is it conceivable the aircraft design will change based on the availability and the capabilities of the vertiport? You know, in in the retrospect, it's it's short-term, long-term. We will see it go both ways for a time. And it depends probably on where you are on the planet. There are going to be those locations that are outside the U.S. that we're going to see some different concepts and assumptions where I think in the United States uh, specifically, we're going to see a thirst for empirical performance data before we actually start designing vertiports based on an aircraft. So it's going to be twofold. And I think it's you're going to see a reversal of that at some point. And once we see data on all these different aircraft models, because there's so many different styles of eVTOLs, when you, when you look at them, they're not the same and they're different. So you may actually see different classifications of vertiports. We don't have that today with heliports. We have a heliport as a heliport as a heliport. We may actually see high performance vertiports based on the aircraft. Then the other piece of the puzzle when we get into that is what's the difference between a low volume vertiport and a medium volume and a high volume vertiport? There's not a regulation that points to that for heliports. There is nothing that goes to that. Now there are for airports, but that's under the uh, federal code, not the federal regulation. So what is a high volume vertiport? What is the standards that you have to meet for that compared to a medium or a low? So when you when you go back to which which ones comes first, the chicken or the egg? It's 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 up in the air. I would say in the U.S., based on what I've seen for the FAA, they're going to stay very conservative, and very prescriptive. They're going to base the design on assumptions since they don't have that empirical data, and they're going to they're going to err on the side of safety. So it's going to be very prescriptive in in their approach. Once they get data, 
that's probably going to change. How is this coupling between performance and vertiports and the different kinds of vertiports that will emerge as a result? How does that reconcile with the potential business models of ownership of vertiports? Do you see them as vertically integrated with the manufacturers and operators or independent owners for all to use? I think that's going to be driven at the local level more than anything. When you talk to individuals in a municipality, and I had this discussion with uh, LA once upon a time when I was working for Uber. And if you're brand X, you're a brand X EV tall, and you want to put in vertiports just for brand X, that's a hard sell for the local municipality, even the state. Sure. Because you're putting all your eggs in one basket. For, I mean, the, for the customer as well, right? Well, that, that, and if I design everything around brand X and brand X fails in five years, I'm going to have, be hard pressed to go back to the public and say, Hey, we're going to have to reinvest money to fix this. So I see local municipalities wanting to be more agnostic in ownership such that Vertiports can support brand X, Y, and Z. And if brand X fails, well, that's not a problem. Brand Y and Z are doing fine. When we get into the different levels of players, you have the the designers, the builders, the owners, the investors, the insurance companies. It's hard for any one group to be all of those individuals. And I've had have worked with a lot of really great managers and owners. And I've yet to find any that are really good designers. So it's hard for any one group to have great performance at all those different levels. Sure. So you're going to see the people that de- design and build heliports. Then you're going to see the people that run heliports and vertiports. And then you're going to probably see the owners and the investors, you know, across the board. So it's going to, it's going to be a mixed diverse group, which is, I think something that the industry and the municipality is interested in. Uh, the one group that's fun to have this discussion with on the different players versus a single entity is the insurance company. Because if you own it, you run it, you built the aircraft, you operate the aircraft, you work on the aircraft. If there's anything that ever happens, you're the only person ever going to get sued. Every every ounce of liability is now on your shoulders. When it comes to the infrastructure regulatory oversight, what's fact, what's fiction? Uh, that's, that's a very deep quagmire to jump in. <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, you know, who, will, who will have oversight authority and what will the flying public demand? I think those are the two questions we look at because uh, we, we try to figure out, okay, who has the authority? So we have three levels in the United States we generally play with. We have federal, state, and local. So at the federal level, we have the FAA. Now, what are we going to call this? So right now we have two use cases that we can call this. It's either public use or it's private use. The key factor here is that the Federal Aviation Administration has no federal regulatory oversight for private use. Now, they have recommendations, and they say so in their advisory circulars, hey, these are recommendations, quote, only, but we can't enforce that. So when the FAA comes out and looks at a heliport today, they don't certify it. They don't inspect it and give you a permit. They give you an airspace determination. They can give you one of three. Either they give you a favorable, favorable with conditions, or objectionable. The first one, you did a great job. We like what we saw. The second one, with conditions, you did a great job. Here's some recommendations. Objectionable, hey, we don't know what you were smoking last night, but this is the stupidest thing we've ever seen. By the way, have a great day. Don't kill anybody. We can't shut you down. The state is the one that the FAA points to primarily and says the state regulates heliports for private use. Now, what is a vertiport going to be? Is it going to be private or is it going to be public? And that's that's where we get into some fun discussions. Um, public requires you allow everyone access. This is something that I pointed to in the West Virginia uh, rulemaking for the, uh, the political leaders there said, hey, we're wanting West Virginia to have public use only vertiports. I'm not sure that they really grasp what public use entails, because when you say I'm public use, that means you have to allow everybody to operate there, to including me as a student pilot with 39 hours and my own personal EV tall. Well, when we look at the business case and the throughput model for this transportation mode, that might not work too well. But then we go to the private use and private, what's the oversight? If you're flying 
part 121 operations for American United or Delta, well, you have to land and take off of airports that have been certified by the FAA under part 139. 139 specifically calls out heliports are exempt. Well, we haven't discussed what vertiports are yet. I expect the flying public will demand that a vertiport meet a standard from the federal government. Now, how that's going to be enforced, yet to be seen. Uh, the states will need to decide whether they want to embrace it, advanced air mobility or reject it. There are some states that are really trying to embrace it. Uh, if they are doing so, they need to invest in it. They need to add staff at multiple levels, plan for it, and then they need to educate and train staff. They need to put that in their budget today. Politicians in this you know, public-private piece need to make you know, very good friends with the state DOT aeronautics division in their state so they can become educated on what makes good policy. And then we boil down to the local level. And there's two different groups that we play with. And the one that a lot of people are not paying close attention. Everybody's about the FAA and airspace. It's, you know, really where the rubber meets the road is the land use. We get into the land use and that group needs to partner with the airspace authorities. When you set those two groups down at the table and you're starting to talk about that regulatory issue, it's like getting two people that speak two different languages to sit down <laughs> and need an interpreter. So in the fact and the fiction is what what is on the books, what is enforceable, who has authority and who has the oversight and who's in charge of that. And it depends on what you're talking about. So if it's airspace, FAA. If it's land use, that's probably local municipalities. So we get into building code, fire code, uh, zoning criteria, permitting. Some states like the state of Illinois you can't have a heliport in that state unless you have a state license. To have a state license, they point to the Federal Aviation Administration standard, which is an advisory circular. They make it regulatory. The one entity out there that I always point to, I said, well, the FAA has no teeth when it comes to private use. The one guy in the whole group that has the most teeth, the most power, and doesn't usually know it is the fire marshal because fire code under NFPA 418 specifically points to the FAAC and makes it regulatory. Mm -hmm. So the FAA can't shut you down, but the fire marshal could. So in your discussions with market leaders, what is the path that most are taking in this uncertainty? Um, I've seen it all over the board. Or in your opinion, let me just add, what do you think is the path to go? I think when you're looking at setting yourself up for success in this space, it's kind of like um, I had this conversation uh, yesterday. I'm a scout for a major league baseball team, and I'm helping you build your team. So you need a pitcher, you need a first baseman, a second baseman, and so on and so forth. Each one of those individuals have very special traits and characteristics, experience and history. Same with an advanced air mobility team. You need to get a team on staff. And you need to figure out who those team members need to be. You need somebody that is really capable in land use zoning. You need somebody that's really capable in airspace. You need somebody that knows what they're talking about on environmental impact. What about wildlife impact? What about power, power grid, grid health, grid uh, capability, sustainability? So you need to figure out who needs to be on your roster. And then you need to go out and find those people and plug them in. And once you have your team, <laughs> Then you need to start training your team uh, because if you don't, you're not going to win this. So that's the best analogy I can give you as far as recommendation to be it local or state. Let's say I'm an investor in one of the UAM companies. I got to tell you, I'm a little nervous listening to this. What I'm hearing is that the vertiports are still being defined. My mission as a UAM, if I have to get into urban areas, I mean, there's there's so much complexity to putting the vertiports into the cities. And I don't have a mission unless vertiports are low, all over the cities, correct? I mean, accessibility is a huge part of the value of my vehicle. Should I be nervous as an investor here? No, you bring, bring up a fantastic point. I think being nervous is a good thing. You should be paying very close attention to the fine details. There's all these great, grandiose ideas, but it's you know those little details that are going to sidetrack and derail your investment. So when we talk about accessibility, we talk about the aspect of getting these vertiports in. Some of the things we pay attention to is what's going to happen first. So will we be moving people in three years? Maybe. Will we be moving cargo in three years? Probably more, more apt to be moving cargo. One of the aspects that we look at for vertiport success is multiple lines of revenue. If you look at heliports on a whole, 
today, most that have ever set foot in that trying to be a business case have failed. And a lot of it's because they didn't have a good business case, number one, but they only had like, oh, we sell fuel. Well, that's not enough. So you need multiple lines of revenue, investment into the energy grid. And then when you look at a, a vertiport, you need to look and say, what else can I do besides being just a vertiport? And you look at multimodal transportation and you want to make sure that you're the hub for charging. So you want to make sure that you bring in power, not only for your vertiport, but also for buses and trucks and boats and cars. Now you have a viable resource that if your vertiport takes a while to manifest itself, you're still making money. Accessibility, you talked about, that's that's a key element. It's like I, I looked at a lot of places people sent me to in LA and San Francisco to evaluate. I kind of looked around. It's like, nobody wants to come here. Why would I put a vertiport here? It's a crappy place. Yeah, you got a great footprint and yeah, you got great airspace, but no one wants to come here. So when you look through that lens on what makes a good location, there are multiple things you have to pay attention to. Real estate, how much square footage you got, clear airspace, weather plays a huge role, winds, turbulence, temperatures, visibilities, and ceilings. Then we get into the ability to move electricity. If you're an all-electric system and you're dependent on electricity, it's about a million dollars a mile to move electricity. And if you're looking at having a large vertiport, you're probably going to have to have your own substation. Well, if there's one thing people hate more than heliports, it's substations. It's one of those, <laughs> not in my backyard. Yeah, I want electricity, but don't build that here. The only last point on that is the timeline. So if I have to put in a substation to support this, while it may only take me six months to do the FAA paperwork. It takes two years to permit a substation, it takes two years to build one, and all the components are on back order 18 to 24 months. Taking that into account as an investor, that is a huge challenge. The question of energy brings up another interesting question. Given that there is still uncertainty in terms of the energy that will be powering some of these vehicles, how big of a challenge, how expensive and difficult will it be for a vertiport operator to maintain different kinds of energy, be it electric or hydrogen or gasoline infrastructure? I would say as a, as a vertiport owner and operator, flexibility will be huge. And how you, how do you remain flexible is going to be a challenge because demand is going to drive the case. So if you see the demand for electric outpacing traditional jet fuel or to hydrogen, that's probably the direction you got to put your investment. But at some point, you have to still pay attention to the hydrogen because it may actually catch on. So when you're designing and building infrastructure, you need to make sure that you build for longevity and future-proof it so that if that does happen, you can then slide into that space because you took that into consideration. But that's uh, easier said than done, right? I mean, you can't just uh, easily switch or add another energy infrastructure. Um, no, that's, that's, that, that becomes a fun part. Now, I would say from a theoretical standpoint, if hydrogen produces, as we've been told, a, a much better performance energy source. Whereas we're getting more bang for our buck, if you will, I can actually get a higher level endurance. So if, if my electric aircraft can only do 50 minutes before I need a recharge, I'm going to have to have recharging at every site I go to. However, if we you know crack that code for hydrogen and say, I get two, two and a half hours of endurance before I need to recharge that system or refill that system. And now I don't need as much infrastructure at all those locations. I could probably put my hydrogen infrastructure at a central location. All my landing areas are now, I don't have that same infrastructure requirement. When we look at jet fuel, we, we that's where we're at today. A lot of places don't have jet fuel because well, I can fly for two hours on one tank of fuel. Well, if my all my flights are 20 minutes, I could do several before I need gas. I'll just go back to the home base, get gas, and then come back out. Kind of like how taxis and buses and trains are designed today. So when we look at the investor piece and the infrastructure piece, flexibility, it, it's not an easy thing. It's going to be hard, but paying attention to what that is, where that then manifest from a usability standpoint, how much in, how much am I willing to spend on the infrastructure? If I am going to put hydrogen in, is that even viable for me? How much is it going to cost me to put in electricity? That may be a whole lot cheaper. Maybe I do that. If the demand's there, maybe it makes business sense and I invest that money. It, it, it's not a question, I think, on the, use, on the use case of 
energy that the FAA really pays as much attention. The key element, I think, when we design the infrastructure, when we talk about the different energy models, it's it's around the fire safety because fire safety for fuel versus fire safety for electricity versus fire safety for hydrogen. Each one of those are so different that you have to build infrastructure to support that. That's going to be one of the other driving factors. Flexibility will cost, and ultimately somebody needs to pay for it. So how do you expect this part of the equation to unfold? Who pays for the vertiports? How will these fees be collected? Oh, that is a wonderful one. Um, I've had this discussion with NASA. When we look at private use, private funds, uh, that's, that's one flavor. Public, a lot of people have used the term AIP funding. That stands for Airport Improvement Planning, which is federal grant funding. That is one option. However, I always tell people you have to pay close attention to the fact that when you take federal funding, you also take on the burden of meeting a lot of standards. And you have to make sure that your facility, be it an airport, heliport, or vertiport, meet those standards. And you cannot discriminate against who uses your facility. You have to be open to everybody. So one question that came into my mind when we looked at who pays for that, there is passenger taxes that are assessed that that money then goes back to pay for infrastructure. But we've gone out of our way in the federal government to say that private use facilities can't accept that. They're not eligible for that. Well, if I'm paying taxes because of the passenger, you would think I'd be able to have the access to funding for the infrastructure. Now, in the United States, the public-private concept is not really taken off like it has in other countries. I see other infrastructure besides the physical vertiport, the charging infrastructure, the substations, that's one. The air traffic control system is another one. Third one would be weather. When we look at that as an infrastructure element, who pays for that? Because if I put in air traffic control, that may service multiple vertiports, not just one. So how do I allocate those funds? How is that paid for? So it's going to be a combination, I think, at the end of the day. Uh, There's going to be some rule changes that are necessary to accommodate some of that. The states do do get discretionary funding through the AIP grant money that they can use. Generally, it's not a a big amount. Today, the FAA has over 6,000 heliports on record. We've found that the FAA's database is about 2,000 short. So we'll say about 8,000 heliports in the United States. Out of that, 58 are public use. And out of that 58 that are public use, only three heliports on history have ever gotten federal grant funding. So what's this look like for vertiports? No one knows. And I have a feeling there's going to have to be some regulatory changes to pave the way through Congress to allow for that federal money to be used at the vertiport level. It's one thing I'm going to do after this podcast, I'm going to go to the 10 Ks of the public companies that are advanced air mobility companies and look under the risk section to see how they've outlined the risk of vertiports being available, right? Right. Because, you know, this is a big deal. Five years from now, what are we more likely to see? Vertiports waiting for VTOLs to land or VTOLs waiting for vertiports to land on? I think in the beginning, you're going to see maximum flexibility. You're going to see EV tall aircraft landing at infrastructure that exists. Right. Infrastructure that exists that will be compatible. You're talking airports. Very few heliports are going to be compatible with EV tall aircraft without significant modifications. So the first phase of airports, it's existing infrastructure. It's designed for planes, you know, for aircraft. So airports could see a bit of a pickup in traffic however they're going to charge for it with the initial wave of vehicles. Right. So I I see a lot of airports out there that have been struggling for the last few years looking at um, advanced air mobility as a savior because it's going to get them back in the black and without with minimal cost because the only thing they really need is electricity and most of them already have it. The average heliport does not have that. Generally, probably one out of every hundred actually have fuel, if that many. If the use case for my vehicle is that it has access to a lot of vertiports, then there could be a conflict between my use case and my mission and the availability of vertiports in the next couple of years. Definitely. Volume versus square footage. How many how many landing wow. areas and parking areas are in a particular geographical locations? How many EV tall aircraft are in that same geographical area. There's it's kind of like musical chairs. There's only so many chairs and everybody needs a place to land. Again, I see airports being the first 
line of defense for UML one and two, because mm -hmm. it's the easiest, it's the simplest, it's the cheapest. It's already there. Heliport's very hard to mo modify to meet this throughput. I mean, you could land there. That's, that's fine. You can land and take off there all day long, but if you're looking for throughput for your business case, it's probably not going to be existing heliports unless you're really, really lucky and find them. Some early renderings of vertiports show EV tolls landing on, on top of parking garages. What do you think about that? And what about the weight distribution that these structures were initially designed for, right? For cars. But now can they sustain high frequency landings of a couple ton aircraft with downward force compared to a uniform distribution of cars driving around? What are the impacts? I'm probably one of the first people that actually had uh, brought that up to Uber back about six years ago. I said, hey, parking garages are really good alternatives. And there's a couple of reasons I pointed to parking garages. Number one, one of the things you deal with on any type of uh, vertical structure is turbulence. Parking garages generally are open on all four sides, so the air flows through versus up and over. So that's one. They're normally not occupied, so the code requirements are less stringent for non-occupied structure. They're usually overbuilt to the nth degree and designed to be added to at some point in the future. Most people don't like to park on the top because of the sun. So if I add another layer, now I've actually added more parking and the guy that owns the parking structure is happy. I put a hell vertiport on top of it, I'm happy. The caveat you get into in parking garages as a structure is when you look at the building code, there's a criteria that parking garages are required to meet from a pounds per square foot. So for parking garages, it's generally a dead load versus a dynamic load. So that is based on the weight of the vehicle. So they're built pretty robust from that perspective. The international building code calls for a 40 PSF for parking garages. Now we go over to heliports. We don't talk about vertiports yet and building code and fire code, but heliports to be a heliport for a aircraft 3000 pounds or greater is supposed to be 60 PSF. So now I have this challenge. If I have a parking garage that I want to land on and it's 40 PSF, how do I bring that up to the 60 that I need to be a helicopter landing area? Because now I got to take into account, like you said, the live load and the dynamic load. So as the FAA looks at that as the dead load or live load is um, one times gross weight, whereas the dynamic load is 1.5 times the gross max gross weight. So heliports are designed with that in mind. Now we get into the ICAO structure they actually have an emergency load that we don't recognize here in the United States is 2.5 times max gross weight, which is pretty robust. I don't think it's an insurmountable issue. So what structural engineers do today, we can modify the deck by adding something to it that redistributes that load so we can achieve that 60 PSF, or we design a new level altogether that's designed specifically for the vertiport and put it on top. Now I provide mm -hmm. shade for the park parking guys underneath. I design a vertiport with the prerequisite 60 PSF, and I design it to fit my needs as an EV tall operation. I know that the other thing, and you, you, you talked about some of the um, designs, the concepts out there, we also have to deal with turbulence. And one of the turbulence areas that we have to be very, very cautious about and cognizant of at parking garages is on existing parking structures, having landed on parking structures, they can be really tricky because that wall that is the retaining wall recirculates your downdraft back into the blades and actually causes your blades to stall at one point. So now you're in an area, of very turbulent area, and you're working extremely hard to keep that aircraft centered on the pad. So when we put in a landing area, we don't want any vertical anything. Mm -hmm. Most parking garages, those vertical walls are part of the integrity of the structure. You can't cut them off. So you need to raise it up. For the entrepreneurs and future entrepreneurs in our audience, what are some of the areas of innovation that you see in that broad topic of ground infrastructure? I would look at the peripherals, keep very close eyes on the peripheral. There's Everybody's focused on the aircraft. I look at the infrastructure. I look at all the different cottage industries that are going to be sprung out of infrastructure as well as aircraft. So we get into the education, training, maintenance, auditing, software, hardware, pieces of equipment, things like that. How are you going to move these EV tall aircraft from point A to point B? Is that going to be a tug? 
Is it going to be a specialized robot? Those are pieces of equipment that I have yet to see anyone work on yet. When we talk about fire safety, one of the groups I worked with really closely through the Vertical Flight Society was the American Society of uh, Composite Materials. Here's, here's a lightweight composite material that we could actually use for infrastructure development and design versus concrete and steel. How will that work? We talk about batteries, lithium ion batteries, thermal runaways, cascade effect. How do I prevent that? How do I deal with that? There's a whole cottage industry just under safety on dealing with batteries and battery fires, battery storage. So I see a lot of opportunities on the peripheral in support. Who is more likely to build and operate the vertiports? I mean, is it like an FBO? Is it companies like Avports? Is it companies that own the airports? How do you see it being played out? I mean, it's always the possibility it's the VTOL company, the OEMs themselves, right? But more likely, there's going to be some kind of a common use type capability. I think if we if we look at history, you know, if if I were to use a fixed base operator, so I'll, I'll pick on Signature. Signature is a very large fixed based operator. Many many airports they use somebody else to build their FBO. They may help design it. Somebody mm-hmm. else does do the design. Somebody else does build it. They then own it and run it. Uh, There may be an opportunity for somebody else to own it and then have a fixed base operator like a signature run the day-to-day operation. So you, you look at the different layers of this, you have the people that design and build. I myself, I don't build anything. I help design. I help develop work Mm -hmm. with the regulatory side. And then I lean on architects and engineers who are specialists in designing this. And then we get contractors and engineers that are specialists in building it. Somebody else is going to end up owning it and running it. So there's several different groups in this place. I've yet to see anybody in this space do it all. Nobody wants to have all their eggs in that same basket. It's it's very challenging to do any one of these good. Mm-hmm. Do them all well is impossible. Plus, if I do it, if I do everything, I I'm now on the hook for everything. Luke asked, you know, what his advice would you give to the entrepreneurs? But who's going to make the most money from Vertiports? When you look at the business case from a standpoint of time, so the people that are going to have the longest period of time ownership is probably the FBO people that design mm-hmm. it. That's a short time frame. I design mm-hmm. this one, then I go to the next one, then I go to the next one. So that's I, I build one, I get paid for one. If I'm operating it and I run it, I'm getting paid on a daily basis for that. So I, I would say the FBOs probably have the most to make in this space over time. But the key here, I think, is what's the revenue generation? So we don't have fuel if we're doing electric. So how do I mm-hmm. charge for electricity? What's the tax on electricity? Mm-hmm. Um when I look at passengers, landing fees, passenger tax, all those different things, are those viable revenue streams? If they are, great. If they're not, then what are my other options? Yes, because a huge part of the FBO revenue is the is the fuel. Oh, yeah, that, that catering, yeah. cleaning. There, there are several different things that those that are successful in that space have learned multiple revenue streams. Because if to put all your eggs in that one basket of just fuel – you're probably not going to live long. The the idea of these hundreds and thousands of vertiports being put in different parts of the cities and Esperby and the like, I'm assuming that there's going to be an awful lot of visual and audio noise involved. What are your thoughts about the, the local communities? In some cases, it's going to be great. It's going to bring business or it's going to bring accessibility to uh, VTOL aircraft, which we're going to love. But it, we're going to have to be mindful of the vertiports and the and community concern. What are your thoughts, Rex? No, that's a fantastic point because we get into what are the issues with heliports and airports today. So the things that the public are most concerned about are safety, number one, noise, number two. What are my values of my land? What impact are you going to have on the value of my property is a big one. We get into noise as a structure of a noise ordinance. There's criteria that we have to meet. What a, what happens if I meet your criteria for the day-night level decibel reading? However, the particular frequency that my aircraft produce is like nails on a chalkboard to the average person in your community. How do I deal with that? So being cognizant of the impact on the surrounding area and the surrounding environment is going to be huge because we look at noise, we, we kind of have an idea of what that is. What about the visual thing that you talked about? What's visual pollution? How many of these aircraft are going to be in the air at any given time over my property? What's that look like? What's that sound like? I know what one sounds like. What's 50 sound like? What's that impact? Um, 
There are issues we deal with in noise ordinances that I may be able to clear that hurdle, but what about a nuisance ordinance? That's a different animal altogether. And it's a lot of states and municipalities have something on the books that speak to that. And it's very subjective when you get into the legal ramifications of what's a nuisance. So it depends on the court of public opinion. And if I, I always tell people, I said, the first thing you as a entrepreneur in this space, you want to invest in this space, you want to live in this space of advanced air mobility, you need to have one heck of a good public outreach and you need to have an educational program for the public. public the public does not like surprises. And if they don't understand it, they're always going to vote no. In what ways is it easier or more difficult to design and operate a drone park, especially at a micro level where you might see restaurants or department stores using cargo drones, delivery drones to expand their business and provide a better service to the customers? I think in, in the drone port, the, if we base everything on aircraft size and weight, it's scalable. So if I say that you need a landing area of this many feet, based on the aircraft size, that's going to go up or go down depending on the size of the aircraft. Weight's the same thing. I think what we run into in the drone port side is the volume of traffic. We're expecting a much higher volume of traffic. Now, that being said, one of the things that no one has really spoken to is how do we account for that location? So if, what's the definition of a drone port? What is that? Nobody's really defined it yet. There's no definition on record, though we have several in the United States already that are high volume locations. It's kind of like a aviation training area. You see it on a VFR sectional and it brings you your attention to it as an alert saying, hey, this is a very high dense area for training. Be aware. Are we doing that for drone ports? If you're running 50, 60, 70,000 operations a year from a specific site, from a liability standpoint, I as an owner would want to make sure that I'm as visible as I possibly can be to everybody else in the aviation community so that I don't have any impacts. So we see these notums going out today of areas that are like 30 by 60 nautical miles saying, hey, there's going to be drone activity. Now, I think there's an assumption by many that there's not a lot of aviation that goes on below 500 feet. And I would say that that's not entirely true because law enforcement, firefighting, search and rescue, EMS, power line patrol, gas line patrol, those individuals all live at 500 feet and below. I think the individuals that wrote the UAS Beyond Line of Sight ARC did not pay close enough attention to their aviation brethren that live in that space. Because when you look at what they're saying, Beyond Line of Sight is, and how far they're going to stay away from infrastructure, eh, it's scary. A half a nautical mile from a heliport means that that drone is going to penetrate the uh, surface of the 8 to 1, which is one of the uh, surfaces that makes up a heliport. And if the elevation of where the drone's at is higher than where the landing area is, it's going to penetrate even farther. So we need a bigger standoff range. When I, I, I'm working on designing infrastructure for Drone traffic, I have to take that into account. I have to make sure that I desegregate my right. traffic correctly. I mean, one, one of the realities is that drone deliveries are, are increasing. They're expected to increase. How do they consider the drone ports? How are these operations conducted? Honestly, I don't think they have. I think that um, it's, it's one of those unregulated wild, wild west. Keep, keep doing it until we hurt somebody, then we'll figure it out. So Rex, uh, great podcast. You know, it only you could make infrastructure sound exciting, but it's been. <laughs> it's yeah, a, I, always, I always said, how do you make regulations sound sexy? As yeah, you know, right. That, that is a challenge. Yeah. So if you fast forward five or ten years from now, let's say both with advanced air mobility, but with the infrastructure supporting advanced air mobility, what are we looking at? And, and what are you most excited about? And what are you most concerned about? Um, excited about. I'm I'm looking forward. You know, the engineering brief for the FAA is supposed to come out this summer. Great, but that's only an interim fix. What I'm really excited about is to see them publish the formal advisory circular, probably 2024, maybe early 2025. But that will give us a very clear, definitive picture of what infrastructure standards are from a federal level. The other thing that I'm looking for in this short time frame between now and the five years is the fire code. So the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA 418 heliport standards has picked up that challenge and is actually developing vertiport standards for fire safety. That's in review, it's going on right now, looking at publication probably early 2024. Now, once I have those two documents, 
Now I have something that standards, some standard in place that municipalities can now hang their hat on and point to. So now I can build stuff, design it to a standard, which that's going to be a big deal to my insurance companies. Now, while I'm doing this, I see, like we said before, EV tolls manifesting themselves and becoming viable transportation models. We're going to see them start at airports because it's easier, it's simpler, it's it's more viable. As we move forward, once we get standards in place within that five-year time frame, you're going to start seeing designs coming out for greenfield operations. In the in the interim, how many? Hard hard to tell. I would say best guess if I were a betting man, you'd probably see eight to ten cities in the next five years make a very physical effort in putting in vertiport infrastructure. Maybe very small in the beginning. As we grow and expand, you'll probably start to see some of those medium throughput models, the larger vertiports being looked at and put into place. I don't see anything of a medium to large vertiport in the first part. Nobody's going to want to spend that kind of money for something that they're not sure about. But the smaller ones, I definitely see that being a, a viable option. So in the five years, once we get the standards in place, which we're working on, I will, I will see a lot more interest from different municipalities trying to embrace this. There are those like uh, Los Angeles and Dallas and Miami, they're jumping on a bandwagon, but there's others that are still on the sidelines waiting. I think they're waiting for something that they can point to as a standard because they're looking at the liability exposure if they don't. Rex, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start a business in infrastructure supporting advanced air mobility? Pay very close attention to the peripherals of the business. Again, there's money to be made in support, accreditation, auditing, training, and education. There's going to be a number of those cottage industries, but educate yourself on the nuances of what land use is. What What's it mean to say that this is zoned for this, this is not zoned for that? What's a conditional use permit? What are the conditions you have to meet? Understand what the nuances of a noise regulation mean. And you know, take the time to educate yourself on all these pieces that you have to then lay out on a table and make a decision on, is this a viable decision for a profitable business or should I go somewhere else? Because it's multiple layers of some very complicated things that go together to make this quagmire that we call AAM as, as of right now. Yeah, the federal level is the easy level. The states, there's 50 different ways of doing business. If you're looking to make money in this you have to ask yourself, do I want to do it in one state or do I want to do it in every state? When you a answer that question and you then make the decision, hey, I want to do this in multiple states, keep in mind every state does it differently. So now you have to learn all the different nuances of each state. So if I go to Illinois, I go to uh, Florida, if I go to California, I go to Texas, I have to change my business model. I need to be flexible. I need to understand that because if I don't and I don't know to do that, it's going to cost me time and energy and money. The municipality level, that's when you get into that court of public opinion and you have to go in front of zoning commissions. Those are open hearings. You have to go in front of a um, city council, plead your case. Those are open meetings. And those are politically appointed people who want to get reelected. And if you don't give them a clear path and you don't educate those public officials and you're trying to make money, you're going to fail because they're not going to do something that they're not comfortable with. What's the most common misconception or misunderstanding about infrastructure, vertiports, and the like? I would say from a perspective of putting in infrastructure is you can't land just everywhere you want to. I've had many a client who, in a lot of cases, are pilots who have heard all the time. It's like, well, you know, from the federal government, they say, as long as you have landowner's permission, you can land wherever you want. Well, that's true at the federal level. The state, however, they may say, hey, to land there, you have to have a heliport, period. And to have a heliport, you have to have a permit and you have to apply for the permit. And the local municipality may say the same thing. And they may come back and say, you know what? You can't land there because that land is not zoned for one, period. I've had clients who have run afoul of that and they put in a heliport, physically built one, and then come to find out, get a letter of cease and desist from the state or the mu local municipality says, well, you now have, you're now the proud owner of a basketball court. Have a great day. What is the one point that you would want our audience to take away from your comments? It's 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 a brave new world. I'm excited about where we're headed. Uh, when we get into advanced air mobility 
infrastructure, I, I see a lot of opportunities. It's, it's, it's a fun place to be in right now. So from that aspect, I would say, if you're looking to get into this, look for education. Uh, there's a lot of different opportunities out there that are online. There's a lot of different things you can read. I, I find new stuff every day. I open up my computer and it's like, when did that happen? So be connected. If I were going to point to one group that does a great job in this space of education and connectivity, it's probably the Vertical Flight Society, which, you know, in transparency, I work for. But when it comes to vertical lift, both helicopters and EV talls, e stall, EC tall, I don't know of anybody that's keeping tabs on it as well as they are. So yeah, stay engaged, stay stay tuned, and never stop learning. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Rex. It's always a, a real pleasure to speak with you. And thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Not a problem. I appreciate the opportunity, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Rex. All right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss. And goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned, and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The Vertical Space makes no guarantees, warranty, or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general, educational, and entertainment purposes only.